Some things have happened since the last time you folks were watching videos about the TDI TJ. Uh, it turns out I bent a rod. I didn't know that. I was so tired last time I overlooked that. So we've got some huge changes for this project, some pretty exciting changes in a lot of ways. Um, and today we're gonna go through what our options are. We're gonna talk about what I damaged and how we're going to integrate this with our high horsepower TDI series. I know a bunch of you are already wondering why combine both TDIs into one series? Why, why not just build them separately? Well, the problem is I just don't have the money. I mean, as we shed layer after layer off of this BRM, we're removing another layer of $100 of stretch bolts here and a $50 gasket there. And it just gets to where it's just not feasible. So right now we could just theoretically replace the one bent rod in the BRM. But if I had high performance rods and I had like uh, high performance heavy duty valve springs in this thing, we wouldn't be here in the first place. I don't wanna have to pull this motor back out. So what I think is gonna be the most practical uh, financially and to be able to finally combine, you know, two series that I'm passionate about is gonna be put all my eggs in one basket. We're gonna use stuff off the BRM that are minor upgrades for the BHW that a lot of people probably aren't aware of. And we're just gonna use the best parts of both engines to make one really good Frankenstein engine. Uh, my goal now, instead of like four or 500 horse, I just, I, did, I use those numbers just very loose. Like we should be able to reach that. My goal now is I'd be very happy with 300 and we're still gonna have spray available if, if we need it. Um, Cause we're still gonna hook this up with nitrous and stuff just for funsies. But we're gonna be using two turbos now instead of one. We should have plenty of boost to make crazy power. But the goal here is to make it more reliable and be more powerful. And with the, the rods we're using are good for a thousand horsepower and the valve springs that we're using are good for way higher RPM, but we're not gonna go to a thousand horsepower and we're not gonna go to these high RPM ranges. So I think that on paper, especially with the head studs, everything that we're using in this, our, our bottom end girdle, it's gonna make it to where this is more reliable and it's gonna be more fuel efficient and it's gonna be more powerful. It should be a really interesting balance of all of these different columns we try to check when we build high performance stuff. And we're gonna learn a lot along the way together. There's a lot of this, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I know exactly how about 90% of this is gonna go. <laughs> the other 10% we're gonna to discover together and see what, what, how many cans of worms we're gonna be opening whenever we try to combine different engines from different generations like this. Years ago, I made this little adapter that I could work, that would work with a dial indicator and I could put the dial indicator on the top of a piston and I could make sure that, that we don't have any bent rods. And that was the plan for this video. This video is gonna be tear down the bottom end, tear down the top end, make sure that everything is good to go before we reassemble it because we just assumed that we had an injector issue. But what's funny is when I came back out here and I wasn't all exhausted, right away, I looked at that piston and I'm like, ooh, we have a big problem here. So I cleaned off all the carbon. And I mean, this is lower than the deck of this block. And this is like almost identically, like the exact same height. So clearly this is bent. <laughs> No measurements needed. If you can see it and you can feel it, um, that's already, that's a big problem, right? So what I wanna do today, because we're gonna be waiting on, we, we're still waiting on some parts. I wanna go over the full recipe. We have a ton of performance parts here in the shop. I'm gonna go over the full recipe, including turbos and everything that we're gonna to use to build the BHW. But first, I just wanna tear apart this head. I wanna pull the injectors out very carefully. We're gonna pull off the intake and exhaust manifolds. And I think what I wanna do is pull these valves to see if this is uh, still a good head. Because if it's just one bent valve, I can replace the one bent valve and there's a lot of value and a perfectly good head like this. So I could sell it and recoup some of my money that I'm losing from basically losing an engine. Um, and it'll also answer some questions on whether or not this valve clattered into the piston. Many of you who are familiar with my channel know that I'm also a dad. I'm not just a guy who makes videos on the internet. And I think that it's important for us as parents to try and pass on the information and the different skills that we learned in our lifetime to our kids. So in today's video, we're gonna bring in my son. I'm gonna continue to show him different things in the shop. Um, when he was two, he was already separating his first engine transmission. And now that he's four, he's starting to learn and remember a lot of the different terms like cherry picker and turbo and head casket. So 
it's important for me to continue this education. And uh, even though this might be a little bit distracting for some, I'm going to keep it in here because I think it's important um, for me to work with my son out here and not always be working on these projects by myself. It's called a turbo, right? So we need to take off the turbo and then we're going to take off our intake manifold. Now you're gonna put a new turbo on? Um, we are gonna put new turbos on, but we're, we're gonna put a bunch of parts from this motor onto that motor and we're gonna put a really big turbo on. Oh. It's gonna go super fast. Does that sound fun? Yeah. Okay. Well, first step is remove the old turbo. Turn it already loose. You remember how to use this, right? That wore you out? Yeah. That much work, huh? <laughs> now, you should be able to take the turbo off. Oh, yeah. whoa, we did it! After pulling off the turbo and the intake manifold, we were able to work our way to injectors, which is kind of a new concept, and trying to explain that to a four-year-old was only semi-successful. But either way, we progressed forward, and I was able to finally start removing these valves. After I got a hang of the valve spring compressing tool, I was able to bring Chris over and kind of show him what I was doing, and just try to reinforce the use of these Perfect. specialty okay. tools in the shop hey, and get him really comfortable with this stuff. All right, go ahead, buddy. I'm gonna film real quick, okay? You gonna help me? Okay, so the valves actually look great. Chris and I pulled these out, didn't we? Yeah. Yep, and okay, I'm gonna give it to you, but you can't drop it. Okay, and so around the valve looks nice and shiny silver. Around the seat looks nice and shiny silver. All of them pulled right out, which is a good sign. If you have one that you're trying to pull out and it's like, you gotta give it some force. Like I'm talking like pry it, that's a sign of a bent valve. Um, right now, everything looks really good. I'm gonna do an unscientific check, uh, but this is something that I've seen other people do and it does seem to work. I'm gonna chuck this in the drill and usually if you see any wobble, I mean like a tiny, tiny bit of wobble is probably gonna be normal. They'll probably all have just like the smallest amount just because of the, uh, I guess tolerances of the drill, but what we're gonna be looking for is a major wobble. But right now, I don't protect, I don't particularly think we're gonna have any wobble. And so if none of them wobble and they look good, then I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of time into the head. We're gonna clean it up super, super good. And then we will uh, we'll take and we'll do a valve grind. Well, not really technically a valve grind. We're gonna do what's called lapping the valves. We'll put lapping compound on there. We'll spin the valves really good and that'll be another way to test if they're bent because we'll start to see like uneven wear all the way around. What's that, buddy? That's right, that's a little pickup arm too. Which one do you like better? I like the other one better too, good call. In the interest of making some speedy progress on this project, I decided to suspend shop class for a little bit and just get some work done. I checked all the valves, they looked great. I cleaned all the carbon off of all the valves and then I just went through and cleaned this head very thoroughly in my parts washer. After that step, it's time for the real check which is gonna be lap all these valves. So now that everything has passed all of my checks up to this point, I know that it's worth the time to lap these valves and this is for two different reasons. We want to check these valves because we're definitely gonna see if they're bent whenever we're using lapping compound, but we also want to just make sure that this has a really good seat and allow the cylinder to build proper compression. I never feel very comfortable assembling engines dry and that even comes all the way down to just putting the valves back in the head. So I prefer to use automatic transmission fluid. I find that this burns off very clean. It mixes very well with oil and especially when it comes to diesels. I mean, with an old school diesel, you can run it on just pure automatic transmission fluid. So this is my assembly lube of choice when it comes to a really thin lubricant that'll burn off very easily. I have a special device that I'm not sure if you can buy anymore, but you can use it to magnetize any screwdriver. And I think that when you're installing these valve spring retainers, it's so much easier with a small magnetic screwdriver, and especially if you use just a little bit of grease, because then once you get it to stick to the valve stem, it sticks a lot better once there's a little bit of grease stuck on the inside to keep it from coming back off and following your magnetic screwdriver. Check out this beauty. This head is absolutely Good to go for the next project. I don't know if I'm gonna sell it or if I'm gonna keep it. I mean, I, I just don't know yet. I mean, the reality is this is a perfectly good head. I had already lapped the valves before and then I just relapped them. Everything looks absolutely perfect. So 
This thing's ready to go for the next owner. Even these uh, lifters and everything only have like 15 miles on them because I had my buddy Josh uh, throw a, my high performance cam. This is a stage two cam, uh, the new lifters and some uh, high performance studs and everything in there while I was on vacation just because I didn't have time and he didn't see anything wrong with it. And now we know there is nothing wrong with it. So it's 100% cleaned up and I'm gonna put it in a plastic bag. I'll either sell it like with the cam and everything or I'll hold on to it. I don't know exactly when I'm gonna do this old engine yet. So we know for sure what happened and why it didn't run right is this bent rod. Um, it's a bummer, but it just is what it is. I think that because when I was on that obstacle, the front end was up for so long and it drank enough oil and it collected into my intercooler because the intercooler is a low spot. Once I started to rev it super high and then the throttle pedal had a malfunction, it started taking big gulps of that oil. And because the engine was at an incline, I think that all that oil shot right into the rear cylinder. If it was just oil vapor, this engine would have digested it just fine, but it was probably just so much oil vapor all to the rear piston that it hydrolocked and bent the piston. That's, that's what I think happened because the rest of these look mint. Um, yeah. So anyway, we have a new engine to build <laughs> and we shouldn't have that problem in the future because I've got some other things that we're going to do, including building a really nice catch can setup to make sure that we don't have a problem like that in the future. So let's talk about all our performance parts we're going to put in this build. We've got a brand new clutch set up from Center Force. Um, I'm working with quite a few sponsors to make this possible. It's taken me over a year to accumulate all this stuff, but we've got uh, low compression pistons. This is something I got off of eBay, just a generic exhaust manifold for our compound turbo setup. Uh, everything in front of you is from a company called White Bread Performance. Check this out, property of dirt lifestyle. <laughs> it's pretty rad. So I'm working with Matt from White Bread Performance. I believe it's White Bread. It's either white bread or wit bread, you tell me. Um, but he makes some amazing parts and pieces, heavy duty valve springs. Um, this is like a special adapter to make it to where um, we can remote mount our, our oil filter, which is gonna make it way easier to install the new motor and easier for us to supply oil to our turbo. This is the turbo we're gonna use. Well, one of them, this is a HY35. So let's head over to our whiteboard and we'll talk about all the parts and pieces it's gonna to take to make this build possible. When I first started making videos on the internet and I unveiled my TDITJ project, I just had miles of questions and I still do. Tons of questions about the recipe because I didn't build it on the internet. It was all built before I ever had a YouTube channel. And uh, I, I wish that I had a video like what we're about to do here where it's just like a full blueprint of what the whole plan is and then people can look back at it and they can, if you wanna, if this, if this build is successful and you wanna build an engine like this, you can look at this and, and tweak it to whatever your budget will allow. So we're building a 2.0 BHW TDI. This is out of like 0405 Passat. We're gonna drop the compression ratio to 16 and a half to one using some special high performance pistons from White Bread Performance. So it's probably the only place you're ever gonna find them because he orders these from Europe and then he modifies them in his machine shop to work with the BHW. And we're gonna drop this compression ratio because we're using two turbos now instead of one. We're gonna be flowing a whole lot of extra boost and one of the easiest ways to make an engine last whenever you increase the cylinder pressure from lots of boost is gonna be reduce the cylinder pressure on the compression side. So there's pros and cons to everything. We're probably gonna have a little bit harder cold starts with the lower compression pistons, but it shouldn't be that bad. I don't live in Alaska or anything like that. So this should still be like a very practical daily, which is what I want. Um, for the turbos, we're using HY35 for the big side, an a, a GT2056 for the small side. What's funny about this is our small turbo is still bigger than the turbo that I have in, or that I had on that BRM, which was an upgrade over the factory turbo. <laughs> so these are, these are big. We're gonna be moving a ton of air and making a ton of power. Right now, the injectors we're using are BEW bodies. So BEW is an engine code. Um, so if you just type in BEW TDI, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, supposedly these injector bodies are the highest flowing pump deuce injector bodies. And we're gonna use, uh, they have Bazeo race nozzles attached to them. So this is all information that I got four years ago whenever I built this Jeep. And there was a guy in Idaho who was building these injectors back then. I'm having a hard time getting a hold of him now. But whenever he built these for me, he said that they, this setup was good for 300 horse. So right now, 
This is only a 300 horsepower build because that's all the fuel that we can make. I don't want to, I, I can't, I can't drop like two grand on a set of injectors and order a set from Europe. I, I don't know how much they are from Europe, but what I'm saying is that there's a limitation to our budget. <laughs> right now we have 300, or 300 horsepower worth of fueling. And so that is the plan right now. Unless I find, if I find a decent deal on a set of injectors that are good for 400 horse, then that's where this build is gonna go. But we can only make as much horsepower as the fuel will allow us to make. A lot of people don't know if they're unfamiliar with NOS because we are gonna try to do a NOS kit on this. The NOS is not adding extra power because it's giving us extra fuel. It's basically liquid air. So we can't, we can't really utilize this NOS kit to get to four or 500 horse um, unless we have the fuel. So right now we're limited on our injector. So this is gonna be at least a 300 horse build, but we'll see. To be, de to be continued and to be determined. We're using engine girdle from, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Head studs from White Bread Performance. There's two different levels of head studs that ARP makes, at least that they made whenever, a few years ago when I bought mine, and I bought the higher level. Um, these ones from, these are not ARP head studs from White Bread Performance. I think these are called like OptiTech or OptiTorque, something like that, and they are rated even higher than the highest level of ARP. And the reason we want to use those is because we're going to be putting like 50 plus pounds of boost in this thing. We want to make sure that we don't float the head off of the block. We're using engine girdle from uh, White Bread Performance, and this is just to help keep the bottom end all a part of the engine and not blown out all over the ground. This is just basically for strength. We've got heavy duty valve springs. Heavy duty valve springs are usually used when you're revving higher. Um, I don't know if we're gonna rev. We're gonna rev a little higher, I'm sure, but it's just to keep your valves from floating um, whenever you go to those higher RPMs. Uh, Tremec 4050 from Silver Sport Transmission. We already talked about this in the last video, but this is the transmission we're using, and with the TDI, with the TJ application, they say that this is rated at 600 foot-pounds of torque, which we shouldn't, I don't think we're gonna be able to get that high. I mean, once you start to get the horsepower way up on the TDIs, it no longer makes so much more horse, so much more torque than horsepower. So like if we got to 400 horse, I would be willing to bet we wouldn't make any more than 500 foot-pounds. So regardless, I think that this transmission is gonna be like as strong as we can get plus we're gonna, a huge improvement on these ratios as far as for like an off-road vehicle like what we're building here. We're gonna use a set of heavy duty connecting rods from ID Parts. These are rated at way more horsepower. When you read the little blurb, it says that uh, people make like a thousand horse with these con rods or something like that. So there's no way we're gonna even come close to maxing out these con rods. Um, we've got BRM intake. The reason I'm using a BRM intake, we can get a custom intake made or make our own if we had a flow bench, but the reality is a lot of people make custom intakes and they don't flow better than OEM intakes. And if you look it up online, people are gonna argue with this in the comments, I promise, <laughs> just watch. But Malone Tuning did a test and they used a flow bench to determine which of these North American intakes flow the best. The BRM was the best. So if we want the highest flow, this is basically the highest flowing intake offered in America. Um, I would love to have some like super high-end crazy intake manifold made. I just, it's just not in the budget. This is already an expensive build. So we're gonna do a BRM oil pump. Also, from what I've read on the internet, it says that the BRM oil pump is, it's got a higher pressure. So we should be able to increase our oil pressure, which is just always a good idea, especially if we're gonna be spinning, you know, higher, we're gonna be putting a larger demand on this engine and we already have a BRM oil pump just sitting there in that old block. Uh, we're going to use BRM coolant components, and the only reason we're going to do that is for easy, like ease of install. I already have everything plumbed to work with all the cooling flanges and everything that are on that BRM, so we're just going to swap all that over. There's no like performance gain over the BHW. It's just going to make it easier for us to put this back in here. I don't want to re-swap a TDI. I want to do everything I can to utilize what's already been done to swap the first one. Um, we're going to be using a stage... Right now we have an extra stage two camshaft. I'm gonna try to swap it out for a stage three, but realistically, a stage two is still gonna be, it's such, it's miles above and beyond the factory camshaft. I don't know how big of an increase we're gonna get to the stage three, so I'm not really that worried about it. But I know that we could easily make 300 horse with a stage two cam and be just fine. And so right now we have a stage two, we'll see what happens. This is another to be uh, d determined part of this. The NOS kit from Holly Performance. I want to use NOS in this. NOS is fun. NOS is flashy. NOS would be, it would just be so cool to have a go baby go button.
but we have to have enough fuel to match. And I don't know if we will. So we'll see once we start tuning everything, if I was able to get big enough injectors or if these injectors actually make more power than I thought they would. And we have a little bit of extra fuel to burn with the NOS kit. We're gonna do a performance clutch from Center Force. So I don't know, I don't know the whole backstory on this clutch as far as like what clutch it is. I called Center Force, I talked to him, I told him everything that I needed as far as like what my requirements were. And they said, oh, we've got, we'll put together the perfect clutch pack for you. They sent it out and I don't really know what it is. I'm gonna have to take it apart and like start looking at what each model number is to see like what the ratings are. But I told him, I'm gonna, I, this is when I was originally thinking I was gonna be able to make four or 500 horse. I was like, it's gotta be able to at least that in torque. And they're like, no problem. This clutch will be able to handle it. And I told them it still has to be good off road. They said, no problem. This will be able to do it all. So we will revisit that whenever we uh, install the clutch. All the gaskets, all the bolts, anything extra, like, I mean, O-rings, cooling flanges, anything like that is all coming from idparts.com. I cannot say enough good things about this company. And they're a new sponsor, and I have been trying to get them as a sponsor for a long time. I am super pumped about this because when I built this engine like four years ago, the BRM, um, I, all I used was stuff on ID parts because it's quality and it's affordable. It's like dealership quality parts, but not dealership quality or dealership level prices. So I cannot say enough good things about this company. And you're going to see we're a lot of the stuff that's going to be coming in next week and the week after that we're going to start building this engine with like pretty much all of it is going to come from ID parts because I just, I really prefer to use the parts that they have on hand because of the quality. So if you enjoyed the video, thumbs up, subscribe, all that other stuff that you do to the YouTubers you like. If you don't help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, net gaiters, stickers, all that stuff. We also have a link to our Patreon account and we do an extra video a week for our Patreon people and we do all of our fan rides and everything for our Patreon people as well. So if you wanna be a part of that community, just uh, click the link and you can sign up there. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.